Guardrails, and again, guardrails, it's all about directing and protecting. That's why we set up guardrails. Guardrails are never put in the place of danger. They're put in the place of safety so that should you bump into that guardrail, you're okay still. And scripture, throughout scripture, it's not simply a proclamation of I don't know why I've got these on. Uh, it's not just a proclamation of the gospel. It's the fact that the gospel, the truth of who we are in Jesus and what Christ has accomplished for us, unlocks the kingdom of God. And within the kingdom of God, we have the resource of Scripture to help us understand the wisdom that God's given us. So we are going to be basically going through that. And if you're new to mission, I just want to welcome you to mission. We're a church that we're all about being a community. As a community, we gather, we show up, we sit down together, we, we worship God together, we listen together, but this is not the main event. This is the catapult, the launching pad, so we can go from being real with God to real with each other to real in the world. And that is the key. We want this to be something that, again, this is not the main event. What God does in us here that launches us out is the main event. All right? So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 today, uh, verses 24, verses 31 to 33. So while you're looking for that, um, we can go ahead and, and uh, just basically, I'm just going to give you some context while you're getting there in your, on your phone or in your Bible. Uh, this is Jesus talking. Uh, earlier this, this uh, summer, I got, had a chance to go through a Bible study with uh, some people when, back when we were still kind of like, I, actually it was before the, the summer, back when things were still like, are we meeting online? Are we, are we not? And so this Bible study started online. We just kept it going. And we started studying um, the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is basically Jesus saying, look, no matter what government you're under, no matter how awesome or terrible it is, you're under a better government if you're a follower of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have a better leader, a better president, a better director of your life than you ever could have and anyone that you ever marry, vote for, or whatever. And what he lays out in this sermon is the ethic of the kingdom. And whenever you lay out a new ethic to a people, it's not going to get a whole bunch of amens from people. It's like, what? He's constantly pushing buttons and causing people to go, okay, that was just a step too far. And if that wasn't, he's like, well, you may have heard it said this from the religious elite, but guess what? They don't understand what it really meant. And then he would tell them what it really meant. So time and time again, you would think that whatever you want to avoid talking about with people in public, Jesus went right for the jugular on those things. And this passage is no exception. So if you, if you could stand as we read God's word, Matthew chapter 6, verses 24, and then 31 to 33 in that same passage. This is what Jesus says. No one can serve two masters. Either you're going to hate the one and love the other, or you're going to be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot, you cannot serve both God and money. So, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Verse 34 says this, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. All right. Now, we're going to get into that passage, but before we can get into that passage, just have to like bounce back to something that this passage makes me think of, and that, of course, is the Nintendo Entertainment System. <laughs> the gold standard of the... This is something that, again, this was so cutting edge at the time. I mean, it was something where you had cartridges, like physical cartridges that you would put inside of this, and 50% of the time it worked, and when it didn't, you knew exactly what to do. What do you do? <laughs> okay, everyone who's college age and younger, you now, if it was a question before, know who the old people are. Yes. <laughs> You blow on it, you push it back in, and that still doesn't work. You found something to wedge. Like I had like a 9-volt like a battery that I put in there that kind of like kept it still pushed down. And so this was so cool. But here's the thing. When I think about this, I think about the fact that growing up in the late 80s, I remember thinking about the fact that my parents were just poor. And the reason I knew my parents were poor is because everyone had one of these except for my brother and I. We desperately wanted an NES. We so wanted all the kids whose parents loved them got them one of those. And so I was just like perpetually thinking, why is it that I have to be in the poor family and everyone else gets to be in the cool family? And, and until one Christmas. And it, this was a legitimate surprise. So my dad had put the message out, you are not good, we can't afford this, you're not going to get one of these. I think like these are like, were like, I don't know, $15 back in the day or something, but it was like, oh, that's astronomical, we'll have to like mortgage the house. And so we unwrap our Christmas presents and it's there. 
And I was just like, my parents love me. <laughs> and you would think that that would have been enough, right? But this is not enough to enjoy an, an, a game system. What else do you need? Jeez. Oh, you've heard. <laughs> and then that's when I realized my parents were still poor. Because all we had was the game that came with it, which was... Yeah, Super Mario Brothers, which just sold like last week. Don was telling me, just, somebody just bought like an unopened Super Mario Brothers, or maybe it was the Super Mario N64 one, for like $1 million. <laughs> right, so stupid people exist. But the thing is that, that when I, this was something that was huge. But the problem was, it wasn't a one and done. I wasn't like, well, I got this, now I'm set for life. Game system-wise, I'm done, right? I couldn't do that. Because as soon as I started finally accumulating the different games, oh, I finally got a Legend of Zelda. It's gold. I finally got this game and that game. All of a sudden, Sega comes out. And then after Sega, it was like Super Nintendo. And then the N64. And then the GameCube. And then the PlayStation 1. And it just kept on going and going. And all of a sudden, this thing that was, if I just had this, I'd be good, became Mm, I, I really, that, that wasn't enough. But thankfully, I went to junior high, and I got into high school, and all of a sudden I started wanting something other than a game system. What did I want? Not a computer. My dad wanted a computer, because my dad's, he nerds out on that stuff. I wanted a car. And so I wanted, I wanted a, any car I could possibly get. <laughs> this is not my car. <laughs> it looks way better than my car, but my car was that model except for with four doors. The 77 Chevy Malibu, 350 engine, V8. I have no idea what those words mean, but it had those, and it was powerful. You could fit 15 friends <laughs> and 30 acquaintances in this vehicle. It was so rad. And I, and I, but the thing was that when I first got it, it was like 15 colors, much of it was Bondo, and uh, it was the guy I purchased it from had passed away, which is really a lot, it's a lot easier to buy something from someone who's no longer living. But this was something that I, I bought it from someone in our church. That, you know, that, that went really dark. I'm sorry. <laughs> I made the same mistake last service, and I don't know why I did. But um, the, I, there was a guy in our church who was an accountant for someone who had passed away. He has this 77 Chevy Malibu, and he sells it to me for, like, dirt cheap. But the guy who had passed away, who previously owned this vehicle, was going blind before he passed away. And it was like he was playing auto body bingo, trying to make sure every panel of the car had a dent or a puncture wound, or it was non-existent by the time he passed away. And he won. He won the bingo game because it was a mess. But I loved that car. And I thought, I'll never want another car in my life. <laughs> but an old 1977 Chevy Malibu has old 1977 Chevy Malibu issues. And the issues were, it didn't last. And, but that's not a huge bummer. That's not on me just because I didn't know how to take care of the car. That's true. But that's not the only thing. I realized that as adults... Adults in America, this is current actually, adults in America average six years as far as their ownership of a vehicle before they upgrade or trade out or sell or it, you know, dies or whatever. And a lot of us, we have cars for a lot longer than that, right? But the truth is that I realize that there's a pattern in adulthood. People just keep on wanting a better car. And folks, I hate to tell it to you, but it's a matter of weeks before we start seeing commercials with snow and a driveway and you know where I'm going with this. There's a car with a massive ribbon on it. And all of a sudden, they let you know this is how you let someone you know that you love them, by going significantly into credit card debt to purchase this car. <laughs> this was something that I realized was on and on. But it doesn't stop there. I do lots and lots of weddings. And one of the, the main things when talking to people who are getting married is that they start to stress about the ceremony. Like, I don't know if we're going to get the, I don't know if we're going to get the DJ right. I don't, what if we don't get the re right DJ? Or what if we don't get this catered right? We don't know. I don't know if we're going to be able to get a tent. And my parents are so cheap. All they're going to do is blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm like, whoa, whoa. Like, we're talking about a lot of stuff and the day's going to be cool, but that's a matter of hours versus the decades that you're going to be married to each other, hopefully, right? And like, the stressor of a wedding is because we know what other people's weddings are like. We've experienced them. We've seen them, on, we've seen them online. We've, we've seen them on Pinterest. And we know what, a good, what requires a good wedding. This is Julie and my wedding. It was an amazing, amazing ceremony that we just absolutely cherished. Every, no, it's not our wedding. But the thing is that we see stuff like this and we're just like, yeah, I also want like a frozen themed wedding or I don't know, <laughs> Little Mermaid under the sea. I don't know what it is. But, but we want to spend, we feel like I am not significant. I'm not loved. I'm not worthy. If I don't have something as good as this. 
And I used to think, I honestly used to think that that was just like a kid thing or maybe a teenager thing or maybe just a young adult thing. But there's some point when you get to some level of adulthood where you stop looking over your shoulder at what other people have and wishing you had it. And maybe that was the case at a certain period of time in our human history, perhaps. But then Satan invented Facebook. And all of a sudden, we are constantly comparing, aren't we? You can't buy a car without posting about it. You can't move into a house. You haven't really moved into the house unless you post the picture about it. You can't have a child. You can't get married. In fact, if you're not in, you're not in a relationship until it becomes what? You're sick. <laughs> All of a sudden, we are constantly looking over our shoulders and like in the comparison game. Even even like vacations, where we're like, oh man, if only. I could be as happy as them. Why are we so deep into debt that we can't do the awesome stuff? Why are we just, and you look at him like, man, I just want to be like, I want, look at that kid. Mom and dad, you're the best. This was an unbelievable vacation. So glad you said that, son. We spent your college education on this. (laughs) Worth it. Okay. What if this isn't the way it was intended to be? What if we're doing things wrong? Like, have you ever wondered? Have you ever wondered what it would be like or what you would have if you didn't know what everyone else had? Think about that. What would you actually own if you didn't know what everyone else owned? What would you want if you didn't know what everyone else had? Like, what would you actually, what would be actually driving your desires and your style or what you want to possess or what you want to acquire if you didn't know what everyone else had? Have you ever wondered how much money you would have saved if you didn't know, if you weren't aware of all the things there were to spend it on? Because again, we are constantly comparing. We're comparing, we're comparing other people's jobs. We're comparing other people's relationships. We're comparing other people's cars. We're comparing other people's kids. If you want to compare your property to a neighbor and you feel weird about asking him to go in the backyard, no sweat, just go to Google Earth. You can see it. We are constantly comparing, and we are constantly pushing ourselves into a problematic situation. And the main problem is this. We know too much. We know too much. The knowledge of what other people have drives us into a absolutely disastrous discontentment. We struggle as a species with a disastrous level of discontentment, dangerous discontentment, that lures us closer to the edge of financial ruin. And the thing is, is that I'm not just talking about like going into the financial ruin by going into deep credit card debt or or whatever, because honestly, when we're talking about the most dangerous things in this world, one of the most dangerous things in this world is our approach to our finances and our money. And, not, and, and primarily for our heart. Because, and it's not you know, whether you're greatly in debt or not because you could, be, you could have zero credit card debt and have tons of money in the bank. And according to Jesus, you could still drive yourself off the ledge of financial ruin. You could have zero credit card debt and have tons of money for retirement, live in large, and still have driven yourself off of the cliff of financial ruin. Culture communicates to us. We talked about relationships last week and sex, and, and this week we're talking about finances. And culture, culture has an opinion about these things. They recognize that these are problems, but they also recognize that the answer isn't found within the church. The, the culture says that um, God must be against sex, and the church must, all they must be about after is your money. But God invented sex, and God doesn't need our money. And so the guardrails that he's giving us are more of how does he shape our heart to be the type of people that he wants us to be. And what Jesus consistently brings up is the way that our relationship to our finances is such a significant aspect of that. This is what Jesus said. He said, no one can serve two masters, which right off the bat, we're kind of like lost in 2021 because the majority of us in North America in 2021 would not identify as a slave or that we have a master. You may have like really messed up bosses that you might call this every once in a while, but honestly, that's something that we don't relate to. And so when Jesus says the next part, it's hard to understand what he's saying. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. So because of the fact that this is a hard concept to understand in 2021 North America, I would recognize, I would encourage you to think about it through the idea of dating. Nobody effectively dates two people at the same time well. 
No dude dating two ladies simultaneously does so well or for the long term. Because you're either going to be communicating to one, I'm really devoted to you and not her, or vice versa. And either way you look at it, it's going to be messed up. You cannot effectively date two people in a faithful way at the same time. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. But then he gets to the nitty-gritty of what he's actually talking about, what he's actually comparing. He says, you cannot serve both God and what? Money. Now, is money the root of evil? No. No. A lot of people think that's what the Bible says. It doesn't. The Bible says, what is the root of evil? The love. And so what Jesus is getting back to is, again, the, the source of our love is our heart. You cannot love both of these. Now, this word for masters is the word in Greek called kurios. And it just, it, it's the idea of possession. Like a master would possess a slave. And what he's saying is that you can't serve two people that are equally possessing you. You can't have someone who's the authority over you, that you wake up in the morning and you're in service to this person and you go to bed at night, finishing a day being in service to this person. You're in, you gotta basically choose who you're going to serve. And no one could serve two of these people and the primary division that we find as human beings is am I serving money and how it's driving me to keep on working harder and harder and harder because I got to get more because my parents grew up and they were they were very impoverished and so I'm going to work harder and harder and harder to get more and more money so that I can have a better better car and a better house and maybe a better relationship and my kids are, I feel so guilty from the fact that I've been such a workaholic and so I'm going to go ahead and pour myself and have epic vacations just to make up for the fact that I don't see my kids because I've got such great debt because I'm doing this cycle over and over and over again. And Jesus said, you cannot serve. You can't wake up in the morning and go to bed at night and have that, that space in between be serving two masters. Well, what Jesus is talking about is this. He says, you know, as far as our money, do we have money or does money have us? If the word curios is describing someone who's the authority or the possessor of, do you basically, do you possess cash or does the pursuit of cash possess you? When Jesus is describing this, Jesus is not talking to the disciples about some type of capital campaign or fundraiser. He's not raising money. He's raising disciples. He's trying to raise people who understand that, that we need to have something that's going to condition our heart better. Another way to put this is that God doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. And what he's describing in this passage is the kingdom ethic he's after and the reality that we mess this up so often. Back to the whole idea of a guardrail concept. If we're driving on a road, guardrails, again, are trying to protect us from like just going over the cliff. Well, with regard to our money, one way we go over the cliff is consuming. This idea of like, I just, I just got to keep, I got to keep buying. I got to keep upgrading. I, I mean, I don't have the latest phone. I don't have the latest car. I don't have the latest whatever. And so I got to keep on buying. And as soon as, as long as those Amazon smiley boxes keep coming to my doorstep, let me know that I'm loved, I'm going to keep on going. As long as I've got finances or the credit to, to resource this stuff, boom, I'm going to keep doing it. So this is unbridled, unchecked spending. And that is a way to go off the edge because I'm basically pouring my life into things that I could purchase to make me happy. But there's another danger. It's on the opposite side of the road. One side is consumerism. The other side is hoarding. Hoarding is running into the cliff on the other side, the cliff face on the other side, basically saying, I am so insecure about my money. I don't want to waste it. I don't want to, I mean, we're in insecure times, so I'm going to hold on to everything I could possibly get and hold so tightly that I don't lose it. And the crazy thing about both of these things is that both guardrails are coming from an unchecked desire or unchecked fear. This is unchecked desire and this is unchecked fear. But both of them have the same root. And the same root is this. The root of both hoarding and overspending is greed. And a brief awesome definition for greed, a good definition that I didn't come up with, but I wish I did, is this. It's the assumption that it's all for my consumption. The assumption that it's all for my consumption. A lot of times when we, I mean, some of us, we get like paychecks, right? And we think, oh man, I got this. Or you get a job like upgrade or promotion, like sweet, and you're thinking about all the ways you can spend this money. It's like people like, uh, some of you, when we, at uh, Christmas time, and you, you get like an Amazon gift card and you're opening it, and everyone's opening presents. And before like everyone else's open presents, you've already logged on to Amazon. You've already purchased your presents because you're like, oh yes, <laughs> right? Some of us do that. 
Am I the only one? All right. Greed is the assumption that it's all for my consumption. It's all about me. And the way that we spend actually like nurtures this. It actually encourages this to basically go, sweet, I'm getting this much money because I worked this hard and you better believe it I'm going to spend this paycheck on me because I, what? deserve it. And every commercial is going to back you up. Man, you live a hard life. You live with hard people. You deserve a vacation. You deserve this car. You deserve this brand of toothpaste. And we keep on nurturing that concept, and it's all about greed. And what we are effectively doing, regardless of whether or not you believe in God, is we are practicing practical atheism. I believe in God, but my lifestyle is an atheistic lifestyle. I'm living as if there is no God. No, I believe in him. But that has no bearing on my life decisions. And every single person in this room cannot get through a day without your finances dictating your decisions. We all spend money, all of us, every single day. Every single day we have a relationship with that. And what we end up doing is we end up like running ourselves right off the road or right into a wall as far as our finances. And we, and we wonder, why, how did this happen? How did I get myself deep, this deep in the hole? How did I, how did I alienate, so, alienate so many people in my life away from me because I just held on to my cash so tightly that I didn't invest in any relationships around me? And the generosity I have is ankle deep. And then all of a sudden we run into a brick wall and we go, man, now I need God. When we've been living practically atheistic, we believe in God, our beliefs are right, but it's not fleshed into our everyday reality. And this passage, I mean, it has Jesus looking right back at us and saying, listen, you chose the wrong master. You chose to be mastered by your resources to let them lead you rather than you with God's being directed by God leading them. One uh, theologian, Chad Bird, put it this way, God's judgment often shows up in us getting exactly what we want. God's judgment often shows up in us getting exactly what we want and suffering the consequences of it. Sometimes we can get everything we want. We pursue the American dream hardcore, and we actually get it. We're actually living better than our parents, and we're feeling like, yes, I got the truck, or I got the house, or I got the vacation, and we're like, yeah. And then we get to the end of the point of of feeling the end of that. And and let me just, high schoolers, college students, junior hires, we, all of us in this room, grew up believing that it would make us happy. And we pursued it. And the reason that old people look bummed out (laughs) is because we realize it's a lie. But we don't know what to do about it. That's God's judgment. God's judgment often shows up in us getting exactly what we want and suffering the consequences of it. See, what sounds smart actually is 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 the the recipe for our disaster. The world will say this, but this is actually how we get mastered by money. The world says, okay, you need to, as far as your paycheck goes, you go need to take your portion of what you need to live. You know, you're paying the mortgage, you're paying the car payment, your, you know, college payment or whatever. You're uh, you're basically living this, whatever it takes to go out to eat, movies, uh, whatever entertainment stuff you've got, all the things that you're subscribed to online, boom. And it's a lot more than you probably think that you're subscribed to, but it's there. That all comes out of this. And then what we say is like, well, hey, you know what? I don't want to be a dumb, you know, human being in 2021. I'm going to go ahead and save some. And so I try to make sure that I'm making a provision for savings. So I'm going to take, if I've got left over, sometimes I don't, but if I do, I'm going to go ahead and put some into savings. And we feel pretty good about ourselves. Now, if you're an extra credit human, then what you do is you're like, I'm a nice person. There's needs in this world. I'm going to be someone who is giving. I'm going to give to the church or I'm going to give to some, like, uh, some type of humanitarian effort because I'm not a terrible person. I'm not Ebenezer Scrooge. I'm not hoarding it all for me. And so, yeah, I can give like, you know, like a half of a percent of my income here because I'm good. This is a problem because what we end up doing, every single, you don't need to be a Christian or a non-Christian for this. Every single human that does this is that this, number one, always is number one. And what's number one is the lifestyle that I've set for myself. So I've got a lot that pours into this because I've got a huge house. Or I've got a lot that pours into this because I've got a car that I couldn't afford. Or I've got a lot that I'm pouring into this because I'm choosing a lifestyle that's just, it's just stinking expensive. And it just is what it is. And so I don't have a lot to save, but I'm going to try to save because I know that I probably need to do that. And then I get to the end of the month and I'm like, there's nothing at the end of my paycheck. But one day, if I work hard enough, I'll have more money, and I'll be more generous if I have 
more money. And that doesn't happen. That's how you're mastered by money. Scripture lays out a different perspective, which is to be mastering the money that God's given you, to recognize that it's from him. And actually, it starts with prioritizing him and like the generosity that's within him. This is so cool because if we actually start with, okay, I get my paycheck and I'm going to give. I'm going to, be a, I'm going to pour into the kingdom work that Jesus has called me into. That means that if you're single, you're praying about what is it that I should be giving to? If you're a married couple, you, you, you pray about that. Uh, what, what should we be giving to? And, and I believe that a primary place for that is the church, but it's not just the church. It's like other things that are happening too that God can unlock this generosity in you and you prioritize this, you budget for this and you do it sacrificially. And then you, you're smart. You're not a dumb 2021 20, person. And so you, you actually are intentionally trying to set aside savings and you make sure that you do so in such a way that you're still giving a provision to pay the bills, but you're also making decisions about what can I afford and what can I not afford. If I'm primarily a generous person and someone who's saving for the future, what is it that I maybe need to nix for my lifestyle? What can I live without? And that is an amazingly good question that a lot of Americans don't ask. What can I live without? We ask instead, what do I deserve? And we're incredibly unhappy. Jesus models a way that we actually do something radically different than what we oftentimes do. I hope that my kids see this in Julie and I. I hope my kids see that my parents don't have like a gazillion dollars. They're not rolling large. But I know that my parents, with what they have, and they're grateful for it. They're not a billionaire, but they're grateful for what they have. And what they try to do is to prioritize those funds by giving first to Jesus' his work. That we're giving first to the work that, that's around us. I hope my kids see that and recognize that when they become, when they're starting getting paid in high school and into college and, in, and into adulthood, that they start seeing, that's something that I want to do too. I want that to be the driving force in my life. The, gen the generosity that I get a chance to live out gets to be conditioned every single month that I get paid. So that they could be this type of a person. A, the type of person that Jesus is calling us to be. Again, back to what he said. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and you're going to love the other, or you're going to be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. And then he says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Jesus is absolutely aware of the fact that our first mind is going to go to the idea of the fact that we're not going to have enough. If we actually are as generous as God is calling us to be, we won't have enough for ourselves. And, and the, the crazy thing is, is that this word, this, this, um, the word that we have there for anxiety or, or worry is merim nao. And merim nao is, is, again, in other translations, it's translated anxiety or anxiousness. And Jesus keeps on saying, don't be anxious. Don't, be, don't have anxiety about this. Don't have anxiety about that. And he says, look, the world's got lots of anxiety. Every day's got anxiety. But you as a follower of Jesus don't have to attach anxiety to some of these things. If you're living in a way that's conditioning the type of life that he's called you to, you actually have the ability to go through differently. Now, Julie and I, do we get stressed about money? Totally. Do we worry? Yes. Is that what Jesus called us to do? No. And so as a Christian, what I get a chance to do is say, okay, we're failing in this because we, we're nervous. That's what humans do. But we have Jesus saying, don't. Don't do that. Don't do that. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? What am I going to be provided for? And then he qualifies it. He says, look, for the pagans run after these things. Look, in, in the pagan world, they believed in gods and goddesses. They believed that they were there and they had like some type of bearing on life. But what they didn't have was a personal relationship where they actually cared about you. They could give a rip about you. But that's not the way that God is. Jesus says, and your heavenly father knows that you need them. The pagans are worshiping gods who don't care, don't know what you're going through but your heavenly father does. In other words, you can trust him. You can trust him with every aspect of your life. He pivots and he says, but. So in, instead of, instead of this leaning into anxiety about our finances or leaning into overspending with our finances or leaning into hoarding and keeping it all safe and secure, our finances, instead do this, seek first. Instead, prioritize, make a primary step of this. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first that. Make that a priority in your decisions, in your financial decisions. 
Make that a priority in your availability of time decisions. You want to know why life sometimes is so off is that we don't align it with the way that Jesus has called us into. We haven't let the gospel, act, the good news of what Jesus did in us, express outward to us in our decisions. Now, his disciples, Jesus' disciples were arguing one time about like power control and stuff. And Jesus wanted to bat home this idea of if you want to know what the example for all of this is, look at me. He says this. In Mark, he says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. So he's talking about the Roman Empire. These guys are awesome. They're logistically brilliant, military-minded. They know how to take over a country like nobody's business. They can occupy with the best of the occupiers. And they use that authority abusively. You know how that happens? Jesus is asking. He says, and their high officials exercise authority over them. In other words, they recognize that all this power is all about me. It's all about me. Not so with you. Our life is not about pursuing me. It's not about pursuing my wishes, my desires. Not in, my, not in Christ's kingdom. Jesus says, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must, be your, must become your servant. And whoever, and what, and whoever wants, to, wants, wants to be the first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a what? That's a financial term. It's a financial term, and, and, and it's, a, it's a hostage term. It's paying a ransom. And what Jesus is saying is, if you want to look for the source of generosity, if you want to look at the source of authority and power, look at me. Because what I'm doing is this. I am going to take what's owed me. I deserve it. I deserve to be worshipped and served. And instead, I'm going to glorify you and serve you. And if you want to be my followers, that's how we roll. We are others-centered, not me-centered. We are others' needs-centered, not us. And we actually, we legitimately framework our life in such a way that we try to position even our finances that we could spend on ourselves. Investing in the kingdom of Jesus. Investing it in others. The end of that passage in Matthew 6, Jesus says, but seek first his kingdom. He's talking about the heavenly father. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. The bookend to the whole thing of like, look, we got lots of anxiety about finances. So here's what you do. Seek first the heavenly father's kingdom. And it works itself out. He doesn't say that you're going to be rolling large. He doesn't promise you wealth. He doesn't say that times aren't going to be tight. He doesn't say that this is going to cause you to sacrifice comforts. He doesn't say any of those things. In fact, just the opposite. He assures us that those things will all happen. But what he does say is this. If you want to live the life you were designed for and created for that you can recognize you're off from right now, seek first his kingdom and his right way. And all these things will be given to you as well. Um, one of the things that is just amazing is that giving, giving is the antidote to greed. Um, at our church, we ask visitors not to give. When you're a first-time visitor here, we want you to be like, just, just chill. I just enjoy, we want you to be a part of our congregation. And sometimes people are like, you shouldn't say that. But what we're trying to say is, look, we're not, we don't want to be communicating. We're all about your money. But for anyone who's a regular attender, who we want to see their heart shaped into the type of heart that God wants, Jesus was clear on how that looked. And the way that we put up guardrails in our life with regard to our finances is through giving. As your pastor, I would be dumb not to challenge you to prioritize faithful giving. Um, that's why, like, when people leave our church or they, go, they move out of state and they go to another church, as their former pastor, what I try to encourage them is, plug into a church don't wait plug into a church go like hard and heavy right into a church get active in that church and give be a generous giver in that church with our kids when they're like when Micah's off at college like Micah you need to find a church plug into that church be active in that church and give to that church be a primary prioritized giver so that, that shapes your life because I want Micah to be a man of God who's generous. I want him to have the type of heart that Jesus wants him to have. And the amazing thing is, is that I have not found a more sustainable, a more effective, and a more biblical way to guardrail a person's life from greed like that. It's amazing. And Jesus said it all long ago, and we get to live that out. But here's the thing. 
as much as that's an important thing for us, and we could see real life advantages coming from those types of decisions, Jesus is not asking us to do something that he did not do. The scripture is very clear over and over and over again that we are generous, if we are generous, because of his generosity to us. That we pour out sacrificially, not because we're epically awesome, wonderful people, but because we're echoing the sacrifice that he already made for us. When we come to communion, that's what we're saying. That's what we're being reminded of. This is like a reset and a reboot and a reminder of, of what Jesus did for us. Not just that we can thank him for it, although that is there. It's that we leave as people still walking out with the effects of this reminder. If you're a Christian, taking the bread and the cup is a reminder of Jesus' body and his blood. If you're not a Christian, if you're someone who I would say, I don't identify with Jesus. I'm just here as, as a friend or as a, a parent or as a kid or as a guest. That's cool. We love that you're here. But this table, this table is for you only when you've crossed that line. But you don't go through a certain ritual in order to get to that. You simply affirm the fact that your greatest need, the distance between you and God, is not something that you can bridge that gap with your good deeds, with how wonderful a person you are, with all your good intentions. There's not a single thing you can do to undead the dead part of your heart the only one who could was Jesus and he did so out of love for you so when we take the Lord's Supper we're celebrating that and if that's your affirmation this is for you even if this is the very first moment that you're affirming the reality of what Jesus did on the cross giving his body and his blood for you and rising from the grave not just that you can catch up with him in heaven but you can walk from this moment Till then, alongside him, this table is for you, anyone who makes that affirmation. So here in just a moment, we're not going to have you exit on your left-hand side, and then you can go to whichever table is closest to you in the front and the back. Folks in the atrium, we, we've got stuff for you there as well, uh, at least the, in the back here. Um, and then return to your seat with the bread and the cup, and spend a few moments just in reflection. Where is my, where is my heart? I know what Jesus has done for me. Where is my heart in connection to him? Am I living as a practical atheist, even though I affirm who Jesus is? And spend time in confession. Repent, and he will hear you. You will experience the rejuvenation of that. And then we'll take the bread and the cup in just a moment. So go ahead right now, all the believers. Exit your rows on the left-hand side. Go to the nearest table. Take the elements back to your seat with you on the right-hand side. And then we'll take them in just a moment.